Recording started. Welcome to the IBA Tampa Bay, Florida chapter. This is our study group for, let's see, it's March 21st of 2024. This is our 112th study group, and we are very excited to have an interview with Betsy Stockdale. She's going to talk about artificial intelligence for the business analyst. Uh, our mission here is to help you. We are a business analyst group that we are here to raise you up no matter where you live. Our title is uh, the IBA Tampa Bay, Florida, but we have members from all over the world. Where you live doesn't matter. It's do you want to get better as a business analyst? Do you want to learn business analysis? Do you want to take your certification? That's what we're here to help you do. We have given you a variety of ways to reach us. Uh, this is our Thursday evening study group for 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, we have a LinkedIn group. We have Meetup. We have Zoom online. The blue is the same every single week, folks. Uh, we have our study group materials, including the attendance sheet and things that our, our members have created for their own certification journey and contributed to our uh, study group. And then we have our meeting rec recordings. We have 100 plus meeting recordings on YouTube, and Bob has graciously put those together for us so that we have an index. We are a volunteer-led organization. You'll see uh, Cliff there in his Millennium Falcon. Up in the top corner, Yulia is our Vice President of Finance. Vivian, Uche, Alicia, and Esther are our board members at large. Uh, Bob is our trusted advisor. We are so glad that he's here with us. And my name is Thea Sorin. I'm the Vice President of Training and Professional Development for our chapter. It is my job to help you. If you need user stories reviewed, if you need assistance in studying, if you need whatever, it's my job reach out to me on LinkedIn. We are always looking for new board members. If you are interested in contributing your effort and just a little bit of time every month to us, we would love to have you on our board and help us make our chapter better and stronger and help other people. Our study group advisors, as I said, is Bob, Yulia, and Uche. They all have their CBAP certifications, which means their attending this hour gives you an hour of education credit. Uh, we appreciate their attending and we appreciate their counsel. Well, I skipped a, chap a slide there. Uh, we like to celebrate the wins. If our chapter has helped you earn your certification or just be a better business analyst, let us know. We don't charge money for our chapter's activities, our study groups, our training, anything, but you letting us know that we did something to help you is our is our gold. We need it. So reach out to us. Uh, we focus on the top three certifications. These are the three certifications from the BABOC, and those are the ones we focus on. The first one is zero to no uh, zero to two years of experience. The second one is two to four years of experience. The third one is five years or better of experience, and then you need to learn the BABOC on top of it. Uh, once you get the CBAP certification. The other four certifications listed below are the advanced certifications that go into different specialty areas. If you need information on any of these, reach out to me. Uh, today, we are going to have Betsy Stockdale, as I said, talk about artificial intelligence for the business analyst, and I'm going to turn it over to Betsy. Betsy, what do you have for us? All right. Well, welcome, everybody. I am, by the way, I am a Senior Enterprise Systems Analyst at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, or JPL. If you're not sure what JPL does, think of the Mars rovers, right? That's the sort of thing that, that they do. Now, I don't work on flight projects, right? I'm not that smart. Um, I actually work on the applications and the systems that help support the work of the laboratory. So I help support all of those people that are rocket scientists out there. Um, but I've been in this world um, for, gosh, many, many years. Um, I have recently transitioned from a company by the name of Argon Digital, where I was a business architect there. I was with Argon Digital for about 14 years. Essentially, Argon Digital was a, a consulting firm or is a consulting firm. And I would be working on projects essentially all over the world. Um, so I've worked on projects a lot here in the United States, and but also in Europe and also in the Middle East as well. 
Um, so a lot of this experience and, and stuff is all information that I'm going to hopefully share with you today. It's just my personal experience, and I hope that you will gain great information about it. All right. So artificial intelligence. Gosh, that's such a buzzword these days, is it not? Right. And it really can be fascinating, especially to see how fast everything is changing and even the way that it's starting to shape the way we may live and work and even start to interact with the world. Now, AI is essentially the development of computer systems that mimic human intelligence. It's about creating machines that can learn, reason, even perform tasks that typically require human-like cognitive abilities. In simpler terms, AI is the force behind the scenes, right? Powering technologies that can range from virtual assistants to image recognition to a complex decision-making systems. So it's not really a buzzword anymore. It's really a transformative force driving the speed of change, especially in this digital landscape that we all live in. All right. So as we delve into this presentation, we're going to explore the incredible advancements that AI has made, a lot of the tools and applications that leverage its power, and really some considerations to think about that come with embracing this technology. So ready? Let's really dive in. So this field is driving incredibly fast. It's amazing that when I first was asked to put together some sort of a presentation around AI, and this was probably in the November timeframe, just how much has changed in that timeframe. So for example, right, Google introduced Gemini. They already had BARD, but BARD introduced images, and then BARD became Gemini, right? Google merged these two together. PMI has announced their Infinity Project. IIBA recently you know, announced their Knowledge Hub, and we're going to take a look at some of those as we get into it. We also have Copilot from Microsoft that's making a much bigger impact these days, and you're seeing lots more, and they're really integrating it into a lot of their applications. So there's just a lot out there outside of chat GPT, which is what most people think of when they're thinking about, especially generative AI. Um, and even with chat GPT and their parent project, which is open AI, they are doing a lot of advanced stuff as well, such as, you know, text to images where you can actually kind of explain what it is that you're looking for and it will develop an image for you. I've heard recently they're also starting to, to look into, you know, play with video and even music. So the things that are happening and how quickly and fast everything is, is changing is just incredible. Now, as we start to explore how AI is utilized in a lot of various dom domains, I find, at least for me, and especially in a, in a role of business analysis, I really look to see about how it can really help me in a couple of areas. And so the first one is really creativity, right? I used AI for the development of this presentation as an example. I, know I had it help me craft what the synopsis was going to be. I used it for ideas on, gosh, what should the title be? Even these slides, right? And this was Microsoft. So with Microsoft, um, you know, how you can go in and under the designer and it'll give you ideas based upon the text you have on the screen for how your screen may be laid out for images. I didn't make any of these images, y'all. I'm not that <laughs> creative, right? I can't do this. But, you know, this is where you can use AI for things like this. You know, productivity. Um, so my organization, we're a big Teams user. And one of the things that, at least on my project, we're actually recording almost all of our um, meetings at the moment for a, a number of different reasons. But to come up with meeting notes, right? You can take the transcript that comes out of that and feed it into AI, it'll give you meeting minutes. And things like, not only from a meeting minutes perspective, it'll look at things like, well, here's your attendance. Here's you know, the action items that pulled out of it. Here's the key points or decisions that were made. It's a lot of great stuff like that. 
And then it can also help with analysis, such as processing, interpreting data, especially large amounts of data as well. So the tools that we're going to look at a little bit, these are the main ones here. Obviously, that first one is ChatGPT. That one's probably the one we're most familiar with. Gemini um, is also one out there that is really gaining a lot of traction, as well as Copilot. That's the middle one. I also want to touch on a little bit about what PMI and IIBA are offering. Um, they have just recently, you know, released their versions of it as well. Um, so I just, you know, to kind of talk about some of the limitations of those organizations tools or their versions of AI. Most of them are, are based on chat GPT, but it's interesting to see how this industry is moving. So I wanted to take a moment and talk to you all about what are your experiences with AI? You know, what have you used? What have you not used? What's worked? So I just want to kind of open up the forum here for a moment to say, you know, have you guys talked to us? What have you used? What's working for you? What's or have you not? Right. And it's OK to say that, you know, I haven't delved into that yet, but I'm curious. We have any brave people? Um, this is Carl. I, I use it all the time at work. I use this, um, I have to do business cases a lot, and um, I'll put in uh, some general background that I am interested in and ask it to give me outline, or um, I'll put in general information and also um, some requirements that I might have and have it assist with giving me ideas for some functional requirements. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times it'll give me uh, information that, you know, I think they'll think about, it may mention something that I might miss and think, oh, I need to go back to the stakeholder and just talk about this. Um, it, you know, it doesn't go, it, it's not as specific as it would be because I can't, I don't share things that are going to be that specific to it, but it's very yes. helpful to at least make sure that I've kind of gotten the general scope of what I'm looking for. Yeah. Awesome. Cover the face. Who else? I also use it for building out requirements. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah. I use it to refine requirements. Um, for like specific, specificity, what that word, and so, <laughs> um, more recently, I use it to generate questions. So, but I'm also a developer, so I'm using it to automate certain things, given certain inputs, and that mm -hmm. type of stuff. Fantastic! Awesome. We it's a great the... time to be alive. <laughs> in the chat, we have one person says, I have not used it. Andrea from New Zealand says, I haven't used it yet, but I've seen in Microsoft, as you mentioned, design function providing ideas. Um, someone else says, I haven't used it because I wasn't sure how it could fit into my daily analysis. So we're getting ideas. Thank you. Yes. yes. Awesome. Fantastic. So yeah, I mean, you know, I have found in talking to a lot of people and, and I've given this presentation recently to an agile group that was based out of Austin, um, to my local PMI chapter um, last month at a dinner meeting. Um, I've given it even into my department at work, right? Where people are just, they're curious, but they really haven't started to play with it yet. And so you'll notice as we go through this presentation, I'm trying to keep things very basic and simple. And we're going to dive into a demo here in a few moments. And the demo that you'll see, I am using the basic versions of all of these applications. So I want to show you what's possible, um, especially if you're just starting to play and delve your fingers into all of this. And I'll also say that there are things that you can do that's fantastic and awesome and not necessarily have to pay for it either. So all the things that I have, except for obviously my IIBA membership and my PMI memberships, I haven't paid for these versions that I'm going to be showing you as well. So things to know that you can actually get into this and start to play and experiment, well, pretty low cost. It just takes time and curiosity. 
So one of the things you're going to hear an awful lot about, um, and it's gaining a, gaining a lot of transaction, is prompt engineering. So what's prompt engineering? Well, imagine you're trying to explain something to a child. You wouldn't necessarily use the same language you would with an adult, right? You'd simplify, you clarify, maybe even add a few, you know, a fun antidote or something like that to grab their attention. That's essentially what prompt engineering is all about. It's the art of crafting the perfect set of instructions to birth these generative AI models. That way they can give you answers. So think of these prompts as that bridge between what you want and what AI can understand. And the more precise and tailored your prompt, the better AI can interpret your intentions and hopefully generate that desired output. Now, this can be anything from writing a poem to summarizing complex scientific papers to drawing a specific scene, right? So you'll notice out there, if you do some searching, there's a lot that you can find out on LinkedIn. There's a lot that you can just Google. And, and I'm more than happy to provide a couple that I have stumbled across. But there's some cheat sheets out there um, that will give you some ideas on prompting and, and how to structure a lot of your prompts as well. But this field is really booming. And I think there's a couple of reasons why for that. First off, it's really helping to unlock the potential of AI. While the models are very powerful, they're still pretty limited by their understanding of our language. So prompt engineering is helping us tap into their potential by giving them very clear and concise instructions. It's also helping to democratize AI. So complex coding skills aren't always necessarily needed to benefit from AI. Um, you know, with very careful prompt engineering, really anybody can use these models to help really boost that creativity or research or productivity. It can also help fine tune for specific tasks, right? Prompts can be tailored for specific contexts or goals and making it really ideal for tasks like maybe writing a marketing copy or generating realistic dialogues for chatbots. Um, shoot, I was explaining to the board when we first all joined that I was recently in transition. I used it to help improve my LinkedIn profile because I had learned in my research that you know LinkedIn should not be a carbon copy of my resume. So I took bits of my resume and asked AI to help me make that more conversational and then use that to help update my LinkedIn profile. So it can do things like that as well. Now, I'd be remiss <laughs> if we didn't talk about some of the concerns and considerations that we all need to take into, a, a, in, into a account, right? Especially around privacy and ethics. So with this rapid advancement, right, it does bring with it a growing list of privacy concerns. So we need to make sure that we understand those concerns as well. So first off, data collection and use, right? The quality and sensitivity, that aspect of it. You know, AI training requires vast amounts of data. Sometimes it contains sensitive personal information, maybe like facial images or medical records. And so you have to be very careful about what you're putting in because what you're doing is you're training this language model for you know, what it is learning. And then it's gonna reuse that information back, right? And maybe in other areas and other contexts that you were not necessarily thinking about. So if you're dealing with sensitive or confidential information, I wouldn't necessarily put it into a publicly available tool like ChatGPT unless that version of that tool is within your organizations for like, I guess, electronic walls or cyber walls, right? Um, so you have to be careful about that. Things also to consider is that there may be biases in the data, right? All of these logarithms are learning from the data that they're trained on. But if the data is biased, then the resulting results when you, you know, send it a request could perpetuate or even amplify that bias. So you have to be careful about that as well. 
Um, you also need to be careful about things like, you know, the data security and breaches and making sure that, you know, it, you're, you're careful about the use of that data as well. From an ethics perspective, again, you need to be very, I think, upfront and honest about the fact that maybe you're using AI for a particular situation. Um, you're definitely hearing a lot about it in the news. Like, you know, I'm out here in California, so not that far from Hollywood and all of the actors and the writer strikes. A lot of their concerns were based around AI and the use of their either their images or the use of the beginnings of maybe a um, a thought or an idea that a writer had and letting AI take over and then that writer not being compensated for their thoughts and ideas. So I think it's things like that that you have to be careful about and making sure that you're also um, being upfront and honest about it. I know there's also a lot of concerns about, you know, job displacements. <laughs> you know, I, it's one of the questions I hear all the time is, is it going to take over my job, especially as a business analyst? And you know what? I don't think so, right? Not, not as a business analyst, not as a project manager, not as a, a developer, because there's still things that I can do that AI cannot, right? I can maybe use AI to help me come up with a great list of questions to start with if I'm doing an interview and an elicitation session. But what AI cannot do is read the body language, right? They can't sit there and say, gosh, I don't think this person really understands what I'm asking, or they've got concerns about a particular topic, or they're not agreeing with something, or I'm not getting all of the information that I need, right? There's still critical thinking that I need to do that AI can't do yet, right? And it's based upon having that real-time interaction with folks. Same thing from a, you know, a coding or a development perspective or even a project management perspective. I see AI, especially in our little domain, to be something that can help us from a productivity perspective. It can helpfully make sure that maybe I'm developing something more quickly or more timely, or even perhaps in the perspective of, um, you know, it's a great first start or a great first draft, but is it going to replace what I do? No, <laughs> right? It's not going to do that. All right. So let's start thinking about it from our spe specific perspective, right? As business analysts, how can we use AI? Well, there's a couple of things in here just to kind of show you some of it, right? Data analysis and pattern recognition, right? You can really use it to help analyze large sets of data quickly, help identify patterns, maybe trends. Um, this can really help us maybe get to a, a decision-making point much more quickly. You know, coming up with maybe a status report that may help us be able to do that sort of thing. Um, I think it can help us with maybe some process automation, right? Maybe helping us to identify repetitive tasks in a business process and implement automation solutions, that sort of thing. So there's a lot of things here that we can consider, but let's take a look at some real life examples. So we're gonna hop into a demo here in a moment. These are some of the scenarios that I'm going to show you. First off, I've got a pretend project, all right? I'll show you the, the outline of this pretend project here in a moment. Um, but we're gonna take that pretend project and then I'm gonna ask it, really, can we outline a process flow? Can we draft requirements? And then maybe draft some acceptance criteria with those requirements as well. All right, so here is our pretend project, right? It's a fingerprint-based ATM system. So think about going to an ATM to get some cash and you forgot your debit card. <laughs> well, what we're suggesting here is you just use your finger, right? So you could use your finger to do those sorts of things. All right, so um, let's go into... Let's see here. So we've got a couple of different tools up here. First off, this is the AI assistant for IIBA. It's what I have found in my research and playing with this, this latest thing, this is Knowledge Hub. 
I think this is a good tool to use if you are really studying for an exam. Um, maybe you need to test your knowledge. And so you could maybe ask it a question and, and have it pop out an answer to see if you were right in what your thoughts were. So, you know, for example, um, what are some elicitation techniques that I could use um, for a stakeholder interview for a, uh, let's say an enhancement project, right? And what it'll do here when I ask very basic questions like that is it's going to give me some information like this, and it does give me a reference. And what it's doing, it's actually going into the BA box, right? And it's going through and it's pulling information out of that. So you can see here, it's actually got the reference. It's actually a link. So I could click on it and it will actually go out and pull up or, you know, pull up that part of the BA box in order to be able to, to see what that answer is. Um, from PMI, same sort of thing, right? Um, if you happen to be going into PMI and maybe studying for your PMP, again, you can ask a question such as like, you know, what is earned value management? And it's going to basically generate a response that is essentially right out of the, the PMBOK, right? That it's really going through and telling you what it is. So I think these are, are tools, they're limited from the fact that, that they've been trained on is the, the standards for each of those organizations. Um, so if you're interested in learning more, right, it can be there. Again, you can see with PMI, they've actually given you some sources that you can go back through. And again, it's going back to their various standards. It's also kind of giving you maybe what's next, right? What else might you want to learn more about? But let's go into chat GPT, right? And so what I'd like to do is I'm going to take this um, pretend project, right, about the fingerprint um, ATM machine, and let's ask it to maybe draw out a process flow for that scenario that I gave. So if I ask it to draw out a process flow, for the following scenario. And then I'm gonna paste, I'm gonna paste that information in. And what you'll see is it's actually kind of giving a um, kind of line by line. Now it's not, didn't actually draw it out. It's actually going through and it's kind of writing this out, which is a great first start, um, but it's not exactly what I was asking for. So I'm gonna ask it if it can now draw out that scenario for me. And so by asking it to do that, oh, it's telling me this time that it can't. So earlier today it did. <laughs> so the joys of live demos, it's now telling me that it can't do that. But when I was actually doing this earlier today, making sure that everything was all worked out, it would actually draw it out for me. But it's now telling me what actual symbols that I could use. So that could be helpful, right? So let's say for user registration, um, maybe I would like to have um, some user stories around that. So I'm going to ask it to create some user stories for the first step, the login process. So now it's giving me some actual user stories that we can use. And actually it's giving me um, everything in for the user registration as well as the login process. So what I would do in a scenario like this is to me, this is a good first step. I would never use these by themselves. To me, this is a first draft, right? This is a first draft of these stories that I might wanna look at. I would then take this and then start to really refine them to make them really going through and, and applicable for my situation or for my particular effort. Now, for myself, 
right? These are written in a very traditionally user story format. I actually like to use a story format called jobs to be done, right? Or a job story format. So I'm gonna ask it to rewrite these stories in a jobs to be done format. So I asked it if it could rewrite it to in a jobs to be done format. Now, if you're not familiar with this format, this format actually has things done slightly differently. It doesn't necessarily start off with the user role, although you can add that if you like, but it's really more focused on what it is you're trying to accomplish versus the user role of it's a traditional user story format. So you can see it starts, usually it starts with when, right? When I want to access my account securely, right? That sort of thing. So it's something that I can very quickly and easily change it like that. So let's pick one of these. I'm gonna pick this story right here. And I'm gonna ask it to write acceptance criteria for me. All right, so now I asked it to write acceptance criteria for that particular story. And as you can see, it's actually outlining in a, essentially in a bullet point format, these acceptance criteria. Now myself, I prefer to actually write my acceptance criteria in a behavior-driven design format or a gherkin format, something that can be put into like a cucumber, which is an automated testing framework. So I can again, ask it to reframe these in that gherkin format. So as I rewrite it, right, now it's writing it in that given when then format for me. Now you'll notice it's now got a black box here. And because this Gherkin format is something that can be used in an automated testing framework, it's actually allowing me to copy the code. So you can actually see this up here. This would actually allow me to copy it and essentially paste it into a notepad, which then I can turn around and paste it into that testing framework. So I don't. it makes it very easy for me to do that sort of thing. All right. So I wanted to pause there for a moment. Questions, comments, what do you guys think? I think you're showing us things that we didn't know that AI could do for us. <laughs> <clears throat> for things we didn't want AI to know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as I said, to me, this would be a, um, a draft, right? When I've used it to help me write my user stories and especially my acceptance criteria, I'm kind of of the, the frame of mind that the real meat of my requirements tends to be in my acceptance criteria. Um, I find sometimes it, can, it does things that eh, I don't need that or I wouldn't necessarily phrase it that way or you know, for the particular development team I'm working with, that's not gonna work for them. So it's a, it's a step, right? I use it kind of to boost my productivity. It gives me something to start with and now I start editing. Other I mean, thoughts, that, questions? That's the thing, it gives you a place to start, which sometimes yeah. is the hardest to do. Yes, especially if you're looking at a blank sheet of paper, right? Okay, I need yes. to write a user story. <laughs> Where do I begin? <laughs> what acceptance criteria do I have for this? Where do I begin? <laughs> I've recently started writing my acceptance criteria in the form of uh, tests instead, so that mm -hmm. we don't have to write tests as well. It's like, this is what it's going to be done when it's, what is, whenever it's finished. Yes. Um, and making it much more clear for the users whenever they're looking at it to understand what our goals are. Yes. Yep. And, and that's part of the reason why I like the, the Gherkin format or that behavior driven design. Personally, yeah. even when I'm framing it in my own head, it really, the format makes me really think through 
well, here's my starting state. Here's that trigger. And what is it that I want the system to do? Right. Um, and so it helps me. And, and that's for, you know, and essentially I'm writing test cases as well. What else? So what would, what would you guys like me to ask this system to do, right? We've got this, you know, this is all in chat GPT, obviously. Um, it's been doing some of this stuff. What do you want me to ask it to do? One of the things I'm particularly interested in, Betsy, is um, cross-checking requirements to see if there are conflicts between them. I know there are mm -hmm. Some systems that use AI to specifically do that and to estimate the projects based on that. But that yeah. would be an exciting magic wand where, you know, it, we have like 450 requirements for one of our new systems that we developed. And um, the test analyst and I went through them and she was really good at pointing out, you realize this conflicts with requirement number 303. I'm like, how did you see that? Yes. Hours. Um, and it would be great to be able to have something that could find our exceptions for us so that we could act on them and not have to do that kind of manual effort of comparing yes. back and forth. Yes. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome. And obviously, I, I'm not prepared to demo that today. But what you could do is, you know, essentially, you can take all of that information and load it in and say, hey, you know, what conflicts do you see here? What duplicates are there, right? That sort of thing, yeah. Can you point any of these um, systems at, um, say, let's say we got a bunch of vendor responses, we're doing an RFP right now, and we wanted it to evaluate the responses based on some criteria. Um, can you kind of localize it so it's focused just on the data that you want um, it to look at. You can now, because I'm using the free versions of these, right? I don't have the ability to necessarily upload information, but when you start to pay, <laughs> additional features become available. Um, and so with some of those, uh, uh, you know, advanced features, you can actually upload documents, either whether it's documents or a spreadsheet and that sort of thing, and then ask it to start doing that sort of analysis. So I have seen some of that, right? One of the demos I saw at um, the last big conference I went to, they it was a project manager who uploaded like years of information saying, you know, basically asking it to analyze that information and data and, and what are some of the trends that it's seeing. Yeah. But that's where you have Probably. to start to pay. <laughs> yeah. Just and some... I would also say just be careful because like yeah. chat PG, GPT and in as an example, they're building their AI based on what you're typing here. So yes. you do not want to be putting any client's data, any mm -hmm. client stuff into these types of windows and pulling out anything. Um, that's where you're Microsoft and and Google, you know, where you can point it at a specific data set. That's where those tools come into play. Yes. You, you as I said, this, I, this is a pretend project. Oh yeah, no, this <laughs> and, and this is wide open. So yeah, I we we've had several examples of people taking clients' data and putting them in tools like this to get insights, and you have just broken every rule of the you know of the clients so, in yeah. the rule is so you got to be careful. Yes. Yeah. The rule is, is they gossip. If you let them have it, they share it with everyone else. Yes. Uh, says try Amazon Q. You can upload your data privately and query. I don't know anything about that. Do y'all? Javon, you want to tell us more? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. I, I, I just started doing that like last week. Mm -hmm. So like... I'm a, I'm a regular human and I like I need to learn some laws because I do some stuff for government. <laughs> so I, I basically upload the laws and then ask it what um ask it questions. But the Amazon Q you 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 can create an AWS account and you can upload your own stuff. And it's not it's not public, it's it's private. It's it's set up, it's how it's, it seems like it's designed for businesses. Mm -hmm. and, right. Um, 
private querying and, and that type of stuff. And yeah. you can set it up in such a way for, for your organization where um, some persons can only access um, information from specific documents. So not all the documents that are uploaded is available um, when you're using the, their chatbots. Yes. I just, I just um, went to, a, well, I was in a webinar last week with Amazon Q and I just tried it out. It's, it has potential. Yeah. yeah interesting thank out. you what else honestly one of the biggest potentials i see in this uh, having just traveled to uh, london and paris and, and belgium it, it, the natural language models on these things if you have to translate i almost think of star trek being a universal translator Mm -hmm. this is this is going to be awesome for doing basic translations when you're working with teams that don't speak your language um it, it is really leaps and bounds some of the stuff that it can do um, with language models well I, that's a great idea so i just asked it to, to translate this into there french you go and we have no idea if it's telling us <laughs> if it's good or not but <laughs> but you know what it's a great start so now like now here we have it in german <laughs> mm -hmm. very interesting yep <sighs> yeah <laughs> you know jim the more i think about it doing comparisons between your requirements it might you might be able to use it that way if you have it up security. Yep. So there's a, there is a product out there um, that my PMO director is having me just look at the feature set and kind of understand it. Um, being a state organization and um, we, we have to be very careful with what we put into these engines because uh -huh. um, we, we vet vendors and do all kinds of things that uh, we want to keep close to the chest. Um, but nonetheless, this um, system that he's mentioned will actually um, do those things that I mentioned. It will uh, it will look through the requirements you've generated and look for um, uh, issues where they conflict. It will actually estimate your project based on the kinds of requirements you put in. Um, it, it's pretty amazing um, in what it what it at least claims to be able to do. Yep. Oh wow! Oh. So I just asked it to write code in Python for that user story and acceptance criteria. Oh wow! Now it doesn't mean it works. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's better than what I could do by myself, right? And again, you because you see it's in this black box, you've got the, the copy up here where you can copy it and put it into your framework. That's amazing. Right? And even, for those of us who remember COBOL. Oh God. Yes, I do remember <laughs> that. You. It's a very wordy language too. <laughs> Just this is gonna no. go on for pages. <laughs> First programming language I learned <laughs> in high school. Goodness. So yes, right. I mean, again, this is this is just basic stuff, right? But it's it's a start, right? It's a start. So are we really saying no matter what our task is, if we can do it securely, we might consider AI helping us? Oh, I absolutely. Think if you do it securely. Mm -hmm. it, AI can can provide some of that help. I don't think AI can help on every task. Um, so, for example, I'm currently working on a project where um, we want to be better at how we track the costs of building a spacecraft, as an example. Mm -hmm. uh, and these spacecraft cost billions of dollars, and there's lots of moving parts and lots of moving pieces and you know, you've got your design phase where the, the 
first off, the scientists are dreaming up what it is that they want to do. Then you have the engineers who take over, who try to make it work, <laughs> right? And they go through lots of different things. And then we have to build the thing, right? And some pieces are outsourced and some pieces are not. And then you have to inventory, et cetera. So we have these things called service centers and we're pulling in and we're, we're talking to each one of these service centers, trying to get a better understanding of just how they do their job, right? How do they charge their time? What systems do they use, right? So the stuff I'm doing right now, I don't see AI, AI doing for me, right? right? I, I'm creating things like an ecosystem map. I'm pulling org charts and asking about how they're charging their time and capturing that information. Um, I'm, I'm creating process flows, you know, all the stuff that they, they've given me. Now, AI might be able to help me with that, right? I might be able to take like the information they give me and then ask it to outline a process flow for me, assuming I had a secure environment to do that in, right? So I'm gonna make that assumption. Um, but it would be a start. But I don't think, right, that it can completely do everything that I'm doing at the moment, right? Right, Because there's there's so much. And one of the things that I think is super important for our roles as a business analyst yeah. is building relationships, mm -hmm. right? So it's building the relationships and, and the confidence, you know, with my stakeholders that, you know, this great information is going to be helpful and useful for us as we move forward. Um, that I don't think that AI can do for us, right? They need to see me, they need my face, right? <laughs> we need to have that interaction and those conversations. But as a productivity boost, right? If I needed to turn around and, and provide meeting minutes, sure. Right. To help me get that first draft of a set of user stories and acceptance criteria. Yes. I think the idea of taking a whole bunch of that and, you know, kind of doing the analysis. Do we have everything we need? <laughs> do we have duplicates? Do we have conflicts? <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes. That's where I think AI can help us. Right. Bob says it's all about the interpersonal connection, empathy, understanding, and trust. AI can never do those things for us. No. Yeah. And you know, you have to have trust. You have to build the trust to get people to give you information. Yes. So AI will never be able to provide that unless they have some other way to get people to give information. Exactly. Exactly. So we talked about making, being sure that it was going to be secure. Yes. Basically... <laughs> We cannot give personal information, PII, uh, PHI out there. Mm -hmm. but anything else would be fair game, right? Not necessarily. You've got your intellectual property that you need to be taken into account. Well, that's the uh -huh. argument with it now. When when AI draws something, it's going out and it's pulling databases from all the museums and all the pictures and everything else, <laughs> and it's using that to paint mm -hmm. or write a book it's going out to your freaking library and it can draw from every book in your library right. that that's the argument uh, writing yes. music those kinds of things that it can do just because it can search everything on the planet much quicker right. than we can and put something together i find myself most irritated at ai whenever it writes article after article after article on linkedin and asks people to contribute and it's like this didn't even start with a person. It's just a generating some kind of interaction on LinkedIn. It's a it's a gimmick. Yes. But I contribute anyway. Yes. <laughs> yes. I always figure those things are truly for raw material to build up AI databases. And I refuse. Gotcha. <laughs> yep. We used ChatGPT um, before our last vacation. Uh, we were going to Guatemala for a wedding and we wanted to do a little tour around this particular lake. So we asked it to create an itinerary for uh, a tour around uh, Lake Atitlan. And it came up with this beautiful tour of all of these absolutely fictitious towns that it made up. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> 
<laughs> as we started researching them and figuring out how we might book a trip there, we realized, no, these don't even exist. This is complete fiction. That so, means it pulled it off something it believed was true. It can't. No, it, it when it does, um, some of the people I follow ran into this early on. They tried to generate academic type papers and um, chat GPT made up all the totally plausible sounding references with all the right formatting and links and so on and none of the references actually existed. That's amazing. So GPT yeah. is a six-year-old. Yes. <laughs> but you know a very powerful six-year-old, but yes. <laughs> But you bring up education, right? And I know that, it, and so I started off my career as a high school teacher. And as a high school teacher, would I be concerned about my students writing their papers with chat GPT? Because you know they're going to do it, right? Mm -hmm. I think from an educational perspective, it's really incumbent upon the educational system. And when I say that generically like that, it's not just the teachers in schools, but it's parents and other support people around those children to teach them how to use ChatGPT appropriately, or AI, I should say, appropriately, right? Teach them, and, I, and I've heard some studies on how some of these educators are doing this, where it's teaching them to use it to help them with an outline and give them that first draft and then refining that outline and asking for ideas and creativity, et cetera. But when it gets to that final paper, then the student needs to actually physically do the writing themselves, right? And so I like to see like with the educational system, really starting to teach our students and our children how to use these applications to, to their benefit instead of a, it's the latest way to cheat. <laughs> well, and, and it's funny you say that because my daughter's over at USF and where when she submits papers, it mm -hmm. now goes through an yeah. AI and it checks it first. And if it, it, you know, for issues, just like you were talking about. So it, it will, it will flag it if it thinks you wrote it with, uh, yep. with an AI or if you copied somebody else's stuff. I mean, it, honestly, computers can check and verify things across multiple databases much faster than the human can. That, that's yes. a strength. Yeah, I'm talking about classes. I took a class um, in the fall and the professor made use of about five different AI text detectors to mm -hmm. ensure that none of us used AI. So yes. if one AI text detector wasn't detecting anything, at least the other four should. So. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, exactly. So it's, you know, again, it's it's like teaching them how they can use it to help them instead of doing the work for them. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I got so much out of learning how to organize a paper, the, the logical flow of information, grouping it into paragraphs to make an argument. I can't imagine not doing that, but I'm on the other side. I know what the value is of it. I didn't yes. understand before. Yes, it's a lot different than than being 16 year old and having much different priorities in life. <laughs> I'm convinced I was never that one. <laughs> it, my parents would tell you otherwise, but uh, it's been a while. So what do we think is for the future in AI? We I've seen uh, people able to do videos that look real. Yeah. People to do photographs that look real. Uh, you can create almost anything out of words or numbers th that are quite respectable, maybe need to be verified. Yeah. What's going to be the future? I think the future, especially from a business analysis perspective, I think it's an, a skill that we need to learn and incorporate into our daily lives, right? It's not going away. Um, and not using it or not, at least in, you know, I kind of put some of the key takeaways up here about experimenting and playing and being curious and just kind of seeing what it can do. 
maybe on your own time, right? And and using like the pretend project that I had or something like that. But I think it's going to be something that we're going to see more and more and more. And it's, you know, like Cliff had said at the very beginning here that, you know, Microsoft is incorporating Copilot into all of their products, right? I mean, I created this deck using you know, the designer feature within Microsoft, right? It took the words and came up with thoughts and ideas about what to do. Now, did I use all of their ideas? No, right? I changed some stuff around, but it's definitely something that I think we should, um, you know, it's things to consider. So I think it's something that it should be incumbent upon us as we go through our career that, you know, it's it's another one of those skills that we need to add on and put into our toolbox, right? Because we all have these toolbox of tools and techniques and stuff that we use. It's just, it's becoming another one of these. Um, and those who don't, right, I think, you know, you'll find that'll become more difficult to compete against those who do, especially as, you know, we're, we're looking at jobs, et cetera. By the way, all of those applicant tracking tools, guess what they're using to weed through the thousands of resumes that they get? That's right? why I love LinkedIn. I <laughs> never fill out an application because they're, they're useless. They really yeah. are on a website. Because if you don't gear it towards what they're looking for, their AI just kicks you out. And yep. you spend an hour filling out that form that nobody is ever going to see. Nope. Exactly. And, you know, and, and a lot of it is as frustrating as it is for somebody who is a job seeker. At the same time, they're getting thousands of resumes. Right. And so they need mm -hmm. some sort of mechanism to wade through all of that to try to find that diamond in the rough that they're looking for. Um, is it fair? No. Right. <laughs> it could be extremely frustrating. Um, but, yeah, it's it's definitely something that we have to take into consideration. I, I had a chat with an HR person and they were talking about how they get all these unqualified people. And it's like, well, those are the people that have figured out how to game your AI filter mm -hmm. to get in. There's yeah. all kinds of stuff out there now that will teach you how to game an AI filter. I just refuse to do that for yes. anything like that. But, um, you know, that's just the world we're in. Your yeah. AI versus my AI. And that's the, and quantum computers are going to scare the hell out of us when that happens, because it's going to take this AI and and give it a lot more power. Yeah. Well, Betsy, thank you so much. If you will send me a PDF of your your presentation, I'll put it out on our Google Drive where people can absolutely. Use it. I will also include the. I will also include some of the um the the cheat sheets that I have found about prompt engineering. So I will include those as well. Thank you. I think that those links are things that we ought to play with, mm -hmm. if nothing more than to get an idea of what it is everyone else is already playing with. We need to, to um, educate ourselves and use AI as at least a suggestion of what we might do differently. Mm -hmm. It's like having a brilliant coworker that has access to a lot more information than we do, and they don't require a salary. That's right. What is kind of autistic? <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, but we can we can play with them and see where their limitations and, and abilities lie. Yep. Um absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh yes. guys, next week we have seven people from around the world business analysts that are coming together to talk about what business analysis is like in their country, the, the uh, projects that they've worked on, the industries that they worked on, the tools that they use, so we can see how they're different or how they're the same. I bet you we're going to find out that they're dealing with the same problems we're dealing with, but they might have some answers to things that we haven't figured out yet. So let's get together and, and greet them next week and see if they're very different, very much the same and what business analysis is like internationally. Thank you so much. And Betsy, you rock. All right. Thank you so much, y'all. Have a good evening. Thank you. Yes. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.